Well, hello everybody. Como estamos hoy? Muy bien, espero. How's it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, and we try to create a character that is both super powerful and also super fun to play uh, in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the game itself, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and we are super happy to have you, so thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Before we get started, a uh, quick favor to ask, if you are still watching <laughs> and think you might continue to do so, uh, do me a big favor and click the, the, the like button, the little thumbs up icon down there. Um, it really helps a lot, actually, for me and for the channel, uh, for the algorithm. So give me a like if you like it, and thank you. Um, let's jump in to the character build for the week. So the character I'm going to do today uh, has been the sort of most oft-requested build that I've had on my list of late uh, for the last several weeks and even months. It's essentially, I'm going to give you a little sneak peek, it's essentially focused on using Eldritch Blast uh, and the Spike Growth spell for pretty high sustainable damage. Um, I think the time has finally come to dive in and to see if we can figure out a way to really kind of get the most out of this character concept that I've seen, you know, several people take a stab at uh, before and recommend and suggest. For this version of the character, like I said, we're going to be focused on sustained damage per round. Uh, and um, after crunching all of the numbers on it, slight spoiler alert, it just might be, might be, um, the highest sustained damage dealing character that I've done in all of my previous 46 episodes to date. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and I wanted to talk briefly, uh, as a preamble before we jump in, about sustained damage per round, sustained DPR. Um, for those of you who have been watching my channel for a while, you know, uh, I love creating characters in this vein, right? It is by far my most oft used sort of character role, character build, looking for like good sustained damage. Um, I know it's not everybody's favorite cup of tea necessarily, although this character for the record will have um, some great burst potential too, and you could even tweak it to get even more, but anyway. I don't know why, I am just, um, I'm a huge sucker for like reliable numbers. Um, I think it's the reason why I tend to shy away from and kind of dislike like chaos magic and stuff like that, as we've joked about um, often on the channel. Um, I, I just want I just want dependability. It almost feels, though I think, um, a little counterintuitive, right? <laughs> In a game where literally almost everything we try to do uh, hinges on a roll of the dice, I complain about chance and unpredictability. In a way, I suppose at least part of the reason why I create these uh, character builds at all is is almost to do my very utmost to like eliminate as much luck or chance um, as I possibly can from the game and to get a character as close to reliable as possible whether that means like damage that you can do reliably or damage that you could survive reliably you know whatever the role whatever the character sort of archetype um, again that's just me and so yeah like the deck of many things is probably my least favorite magic item in the game, for example. And I know you think I'm a heretic, and that's okay, because I love you anyway. So what do we mean when we're talking about sustained DPR? Or at least, what do I mean? Uh, you know, I think the way I like to define it, at least, is damage that, that a character could do like every single turn without spending like all of their resources, essentially, to do it. Um, not zero resources, but few enough that we could reliably put out those kinds of numbers on every turn for at least one entire combat round is kind of how I, I guess I've sort of defined it in my head. Um, if not more, and ideally more, and oftentimes uh, more um, with these builds. But, you know, there are some that rely, say, for example, on your highest level spell slot for concentration in order to get that sustained DPR. And in that case, yeah, oftentimes it might only be good for like one combat round a day or something, right? Um, but at the very least for an, an entire combat session. So 
Is DPR a perfect tool? No. Uh, is it useful though? I think so. You know, of course, we won't always be able to count on the numbers that we that we crunch and report on every single turn, as there can be so many variables, right? For the types of enemies that we fight, for the companions that we fight with, for the situation that we find ourselves in, the terrain, you know, the roll of the dice, of course, and a myriad of other factors that can come into play. And and thank goodness for that, right? Or else I think the game would get a little stale, a little boring. Um, but I like to use DPR um, to help me figure out a character's relative damage potential, and I'm guessing that most of you do as well. Now, as for the build today, a lot of the times when I multi-class, I will kind of come up with a good sort of story reason for why we're taking different classes at different times throughout the build. Um, today, I'm going to be bouncing around a lot, sort of back and forth between two different classes. And so I think for that reason, I'm not going to come up with a great story reason necessarily for this character to be, you know, um, taking level at, you know, levels in X at one point, levels in Y at another. If you or your DM don't love a lot of bouncing around between two or more classes without a good story reason, feel free to take all of your levels in one class first and then you know, move on to the next class next if you need to, and and let me know in the comments um, what your story might be uh, for this character and, and your justification for multiclassing, if that's something that you or your DM, you know, really like to see um, for a multiclassed character. As for me, I'm going to call this like my own custom class, like we've done, you know, in the past sometimes, right? It just happens to have, you know, X of one class as per the rules and Y of a second. Um, and sometimes the, the progression of this particular character class uh, is to take X and sometimes, you know, it's to take Y and that's just how this particular character class progresses. And, you know, we'll call it the, uh, the Eldritch Bramble or the Briarlock or um, the Cheese Grater. <laughs> I know, it's terrible, but I, I can't help it because I think it, it conveys a great image for what this character actually does in-game. Um, and so, I present episode 47, The Sorlock Cheese Grater. Um, what, what is that? Uh, what is that lovely custom artwork, you say? Um, I'm glad you asked, because it gives me a chance to tell you guys about an upcoming collaboration that I'm super excited about. So, this art that you're seeing right now was specifically uh, created for this character for this episode by a new friend of mine named Randall Hampton. He's an author and illustrator of the Little Game Master series of children's books. He is the host of the show Drawing Conclusions on the Geeks Like Us Twitch channel, and he's a D&D &D illustrator. Next month, Randall and I are going to be doing a collaboration that I'm super excited about, where basically I'm going to present my weekly build without him having any sort of prior knowledge about the, the character that I've created for that week, and he's actually going to draw it as I present the character build. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Stay tuned for more info on that in coming weeks. Our plan is to to um, record it on the 21st on his Twitch channel. I will be posting it here uh, on the 22nd the next day because we're going to do it at night. If you want to follow Randall, please do. He's, he's a super nice guy and a very talented artist, as you can tell. Um, follow him on Twitter and or Instagram, and I'm going to post uh, links to his Twitter and Instagram accounts in the video description, so check that out. Thanks, Randall. Um, I really loved your vision of this uh, this Eldritch uh, cheese grater <laughs> at level one. Um, our class to start off with is going to be sorcerer. Actually, um, I'm a sucker for proficiency in Constitution saving throws. Uh, when we're going to be concentrating on a spell regularly, and we definitely are. So that's my main reason for wanting to take Sorcerer here, though we were planning on taking some levels in it eventually anyway. Um, I don't mind starting with it, but you don't have to if you really don't want. Um, as for the race, we're going Custom Lineage. Um, there are two feats that we really, really want and just makes our, our early game especially a lot stronger if we can start off with one of them. As for that free feat, we're going Crusher actually. So the Crusher feat gives you a plus one to strength or constitution, we'll take constitution. Um, we are told that a critical hit 
that deals bludgeoning damage gives you advantage on all of your attack rolls thereafter on that turn, which is really great, actually, a nice little perk. Um, and then, most importantly for us, once per turn, when you deal bludgeoning damage, you can move the target five feet to an unoccupied space if the target is no more than one size larger than you. Um, they don't get a save. There's no restriction on what direction they're moved, so long as it's unoccupied. Um, many of you know why I'm doing this. Some of you may be scratching your head a little bit right now, and for those of you that are scratching your head, just hang tight, it'll make sense soon. As for your abilities, I assume point by as usual, so we're gonna start with a 15 charisma, and then take the plus two from our custom lineage uh, racial uh, there, so we've got a 17 charisma. We'll go 15 constitution plus one from the feet, so we're starting with a 16 constitution, which is really nice, and, uh, and a 14 dexterity. As for equipment, pretty standard stuff. Um, you don't really need anything special here, just right now we're, we're just trying to stay alive. Um, as for the sorceress origin, yes, sorcerers get their subclass at level one, and we are going to go wild magic. <laughs> I know, I know, I just spent several minutes talking about how I hate chaos and randomness in the game, and then the first thing I do is take wild magic sorcery for my sorcerer subclass. And I even promised, I used this in a build previously, uh, it was the Thornlock, I believe, here we go, um, which would have coincidentally been a great name for this build had I not already used it. But anyway, yeah, I used it there and I promised I would never do it again, and here I am. To be honest with you, I, I don't actually consider the, the subclass here, the, the Sorceress Origin, super important. Um, if you like having a better spell list for, uh, you know, from uh, Aberrant Mind uh, or Clockwork, go for it. If you like having access to the Cleric spell list, um, you know, take Divine Soul. If you really love shadow magic for whatever reason, uh, do it. I just happen to like the level one feature for wild magic better than most, and the level six feature better than, I think, all others for this particular build. So let's get into a wild magic sorcerer really quickly. We are told, your innate magic comes from the forces of chaos that underlie the order of creation. You might have endured exposure to raw magic, perhaps through a planar portal leading to limbo, the elemental planes, or the far realm. Perhaps you were blessed by a fey being or marked by a demon, or your magic could be a fluke of your birth with no apparent cause. However it came to be, this magic churns within you waiting for any outlet. So. Wild Magic Surge is the first feature that you get, and let's just get this over with. <laughs> okay, fine. I will confess. Even I have to admit that Wild Magic Surges would probably be hilarious and fun and awesome in the game when they happen. Um, we're told that you know when you choose this origin at first level, your spellcasting can unleash surges of untamed magic. Once per turn, the DM can have you roll a d20 immediately after you cast a sorcerer spell of first level or higher. If you roll a one, then you roll on the wild magic surge table to create a magical effect, and it's this big long table filled with all different kinds of crazy things that could potentially happen, right? Th the truth is, most of the things that could potentially happen to you on this wild magic surge table are either innocuous, like growing a beard of feathers that lasts until you sneeze, or your hair falls out and then grows back the next day, or are straight up boons, um, casting levitate on yourself, recovering hit points, or like all of your spells deal max damage. Um, some, of course, are either minor nuisances or downright potentially catastrophic for your character, like turning into a sheep for one minute, or casting fireball centered on yourself, or not being able to speak and thus not be able to cast spells with verbal components, right? Um, but regardless, more often than not, you'll either be like, okay, cool, or at the very least, that is freaking hilarious, um, even when the thing that happens is bad. So I can live with that, right? Uh, the reality is your DM might not, is probably not gonna have you rolling on the surge table all that often, especially since we're not gonna actually be casting sorcerer spells um, particularly that frequently, uh, at least not in like the early and mid game. Uh, um, so let me know, I'm actually curious, let me know in the comments if you would like the funniest, awesomest, or most devastating thing that's ever happened to you or to one of your friends, you know, playing a wild magic sorcerer here. 
Um, obviously, it can make for some great story moments, but the, the thing that was more attractive to me uh, here was the Tides of Chaos feature that you get as a Wild Magic sor Sorcerer. Once per long rest, you can, you can get advantage on one attack, one ability check, or one save, and you regain this feature each time your DM has you roll on the Wild Magic Surge table. So now at least there's a little silver lining to having to roll on that table, even if it's a bad result, right? And, and advantage is, is nice. It's kind of an at-will inspiration almost. Um, so can't complain about that, right? We also, of course, get spells as a first level sorcerer. We get some cantrips, we get some first level spells. Um, nothing too crazy here. I just kind of get the usuals for damage, for survivability. Um, so we're talking mage armor, of course, would be really good. We're a little bit squishy, but mage armor plus our dexterity gives us a 15 armor class, which isn't terrible for now. Um, just make sure that you're standing 25 feet away from your friends when you cast it on yourself at the beginning of the day in case like a fireball explodes. <laughs> Stupid wild magic. Pick up like Firebolt and or Thunderclap, you know, Message, Ice Knife, Burning Hands for some AoE, you know, things like that, the usuals. At level two, um, it's time to build up the core of our character now. So we are going Warlock, Warlock one. Um, at Warlock level one, we also get to choose our subclass, our other worldly, worldly patron, and we are going with the genie subclass. Um, I, th I think, honestly, this is my favorite Warlock patron, for, for pure flavor, at least. Um, and also, it's really powerful. Uh, you, okay, here's what we're told. You have made a pact with one of the rarest kinds of genie, a noble genie. Such entities rule vast fiefs on the elemental planes and have great influence over lesser genies and elemental creatures. Noble genies are varied in their motivations, but most are arrogant and wield power that rivals that of lesser deities. They delight in turning the table on mortals who often bind genies into servitude and readily enter into pacts that expand their reach. So um, now uh, our magic, I'm guessing, our wild magic has somehow attracted uh, this patron, this, this genie of ours, and so we enter into a pact with them. And we do, at level one, have to choose our genie kind. We get a choice of a few, and we are going to take the Tao genie as our genie kind. That's important. Um, it will affect a couple, a couple of important things for us. First off, it gives us access to a staple spell that we will be relying on pretty much for our entire career, which we'll get to in a minute. And in addition, it's going to affect the type of damage that we do. So, so the next feature that, that we gain access to here is the genie's vessel feature. Um, there, there's so many awesome things about the genie's vessel that I need to talk about. So our genie gives us a tiny object uh, that grants us a measure of their power. It's, it can be an oil lamp, an urn, a ring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And while we are touching it, we can do two things. One, our bottled respite, so uh, or respite, if you prefer. As an action, once per day, you can go inside your like magic lamp. Um, I love how the script gets flipped here, right? The, the genie doesn't live in the lamp, and they don't come out when we rub it, but we can go inside it if we want to. Um, it's your own sort of cushy little home away from home. You can hear what's going on outside while you're in there. Um, you can remain inside for a number of hours equal to two times your proficiency bonus, so not quite a long rest yet, but um, you can exit it as a bonus action, uh, or if you die, you'll come out as well, or if your vessel is destroyed, you'll pop out as well. And you can leave things inside of it, which is super cool. It's almost like a poor man's bag of holding, really. If it gets destroyed, you can bring it back with a one hour ceremony that can be performed during a short or a long rest. So it's just a cool little utility, nice to have feature. In addition, we get the genie's wrath feature here. So once per turn, when you hit with an attack, you, um, you get to add your proficiency bonus in damage once per turn. And um, since we went Dao, for our genie kind, that damage is bludgeoning damage. And since we took the crusher feat, that means that when we hit them with an attack, even if it's a spell attack, like Eldritch Blast, right, um, the extra two points of damage we do right now, because that's our proficiency bonus, will be bludgeoning damage, which means we could, if we wanted to, move the enemy uh, that we hit five feet, right? Forced enemy movement is always really handy, but especially 
powerful for us, as you will soon see. Um, as for the spells that we get as a first level warlock, yes, you know, of course, make sure we pick up Eldritch Blast. That's going to be our go-to spell here for this build. Um, as most of you know, it requires an action to cast. It sends a beam of crackling energy to an enemy within 120 feet. We, we make an attack to hit, right? It's an attack roll, not a saving throw. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the only cantrip in Dungeons & Dragons that it scales like all cantrips do, all damaging cantrips do, right? At 5, 11, uh, and 17 levels levels 5, 11, and 17, but instead of just doing more damage at those levels, it actually lets you fire an additional beam um, for the same amount of damage, the 1d10, that the first one does, right? So it thus allows you to make additional attacks as you, as you level up, right? And thereby do all of the cool things that getting more attacks can let you do, like I discussed at length in uh, the Flamethrower episode a couple of weeks ago. Um, Eldritch Blast rocks. It's incredibly powerful. We can make it more powerful with invocations, which we'll do here in a minute. As for the other spells that you get, again, nothing too crazy, fairly standard. I might pick up Lightning Lure, uh, as it could potentially give us uh, another way to move our enemies. Um, other than that, you know, I would say pick up Hex at this level uh, to use for your concentration to do a little extra damage on hit. Um, and, you know, other things that are maybe unique to Warlocks like Armor of Agathis, which can add to our tankiness and also um, return some damage to enemies if they hit us, stuff like that. Um, one thing to remember, Sorcerer spell slots and Warlock spell slots are like oil and water, right? Unlike when you multiclass with other spellcasters, when you multiclass with Warlock, they don't mix, right? Um, right now you have one Warlock spell slot that refreshes on a short rest and two sorcerer spell slots that refresh on a long rest and never the twain shall meet. Um, you can use either spell slot to cast spells that you've learned from the other class, right, if you want to, but just keep them separate. At level three, we are a warlock two. That means we get a second spell slot, thank goodness, so now we have two warlock spell slots that reset on a short rest, and we get our eldritch invocations. Um, fragments of forbidden knowledge that imbue us with an abiding magical ability. Those all-important warlock features that bring so much power and versatility to the warlock class. I would love to have all of them. Unfortunately, we only get to choose two right now. So we're going to take Agonizing Blast, which lets us add our Charisma modifier to each beam of Eldritch Blast. It's our target, um, making this cantrip damage really good sustainable damage per round, comparable to like a weapon user, right, at this level. Um, and then Repelling Blast for our second uh, invocation, which says that when we hit an enemy with Eldritch Blast, we can move them up to 10 feet away from us in a straight line. No saving throw, they just get moved, right, 10 feet away. Uh, more more enemy movement, that's, that's very good and very important for us. Keep in mind that with Repelling Blast, we can move the enemy every single time we hit them with Eldritch Blast. It doesn't put a limit on the number of times we hit them as we get more blasts, right? So every one, you know, once we get to level five, we're gonna be able to hit them twice. We could potentially move them with each of them, 10 feet. All right, level four. We are a Warlock three, and here we go. So first up, we get our Pact Boon. Um, our genie bestows a boon on us for our loyal service. We're probably gonna wanna take, I think, Pact of the Chain. Um, over the other options. Pact of the Talisman isn't, isn't a bad one either, um, but I like Pact of the Chain a little more. It lets us use the Find Familiar spell, um, which we can cast as a ritual, and we get some fun and slightly more powerful forms that our familiar can take, uh, you know, when compared to the wizard that has the Find Familiar spell otherwise. Um, take the one that you want. I'd probably go for Imp as I think they're generally the most powerful. Um, we won't really be using them for much though, other than like scouting and for fun and flavor and to give ourselves advantage as well. Um, so yes, the imp can turn invisible, right? And then it, it will stay invisible until it attacks or loses its concentration as though it were concentrating on a spell. Um, that means that it can, on its turn, because it has a different initiative order than we do in its own turn, it can, um, you know, tickle the enemy's bum and distract them and thereby give us advantage on, you know, our at least our first and currently only, I guess, Eldritch Blast attack, right? And the nice thing about it is, uh, you know, 
Tickling the enemy's bum does not break invisibility. Um, invisibility is broken by losing concentration or by attacking, but not by taking the help action. Now, um, some of you might want to debate whether, you know, how that works exactly, rules as written, whether he, the imp can give us advantage every single turn, maybe by holding their action until right before you go, etc., etc. Uh, if you want to get into that debate, feel free to do so in the comments or even check out um, the sliding into my DMs episode where we kind of went over that in sort of the quick ruling at the beginning of the show. I'm going to assume going forward now that we are getting advantage on our first Eldritch Blast um, beam. Uh, and again, like I say, right now we only have one, but anyway, um, that's going to change in a second. And that actually does wonders for like our damage and our reliability on forcing enemy movement. And speaking of which, yes, as a Warlock 3, we now get second level spells. And the one that we really need to talk about is the Spike Growth spell. Um, so we only have access to this because we chose Dao as our genie kind. Warlocks do not otherwise get access to spike growth, nor do sorcerers for that matter. Spike growth requires concentration, takes an action to cast, lasts 10 minutes, and creates magical briars and spikes and thorns on the ground in a 20-foot radius. Uh, so for those using a grid, that's like an 8x8 eight eight square, right? That is difficult terrain, so enemies move at half speed when they're moving through it. And when a creature moves into or within the area, they take 2d4 piercing damage for every 5 feet they travel. No saving throw, no check against their AC, they just take the damage. And now our nucleus is complete. <laughs> beneath the robes we find a warlock, and beneath the warlock we find his nucleus. Going forward, this is how combat looks for us. Round one, cast spike growth, try to get as many enemies in the area of effect as possible. Round two, start grading the cheese, right? Uh, you pick a target that's probably between you and the spike growth, uh, or maybe even still inside the, the area. Um, hit him with an Eldritch Blast. Uh, move him 10 feet for doing so, thanks to your invocation. Uh, and so that's going to cause them to take a little extra damage, right? 2d4 for every 5 feet that they move, so 44 damage there. And then apply the bludgeoning damage that you get from Dao Genie, right? It's 2 extra damage, but because it's bludgeoning, and because we have the Crusher feet, now you can move them an additional 5 feet, right, for 2d4 more damage on top of what you've already done. And you giggle with glee as your enemy screams at all the thorny damage, and rinse and repeat. In a moment, I'm going to put this up on a grid, actually, using Roll20. Uh, not a sponsor. Yet. Um, so we can kind of talk about the area of effect and the damage and some important things to consider. But let's get a couple more levels first before I do that. Uh, one note about Crusher. Some of you may be asking, is it really so important to get that extra five feet of movement uh, that we would like sacrifice a whole feet to get it? Um, in my mind, yes. Doing an extra 2d4 of damage once per turn is nice, uh, but couple that with the fact that it just gives us more ways to like manipulate and position and move our enemies exactly where we want them, I think is definitely worth taking, especially early on, since right now we don't have other ways to move an enemy in a direction that we want other than a push, right? So that lets us pull as well or move them sideways or even up in the air, some are going to say, um, if we wanted to, just to kind of make sure that we keep them exactly where we want, try and keep them in the middle uh, of that briar patch, as it were. All right, at level five, I actually think I'm going back to Sorcerer for a minute. Um, you don't have to do this. Doing so gives us some great uh, burst damage potential and uh, maybe more importantly, actually lets us get our whole rotation going with the spike growth and things right in the opening round. Uh, instead of having to wait a turn, feel free to stay at Warlock right now if you'd really prefer. But for us, at Sorcerer level 2, um, Eldritch Blast fires twice. That, that doesn't have to do with our Sorcerer level, actually. Now that we're level 5, Eldritch Blast fires twice, uh, which is huge for our damage, and uh, especially because we get to push two times now um, with two beams. And then um, as Sorcerer level 2, we get Font of Magic, so we get our Sorcery Points. Uh, we use these to fuel our meta magic options, primarily, um, the next level, because we don't have any currently. But uh, for now, we can just use them to create additional Sorcerer spell slots, uh, which is not a terrible thing. Of course, we could also convert spell slots into Sorcery Points. There's no point in doing that now, because we can't 
do anything with those sorcery points yet, but eventually we will be making great use of that feature. All right, at level six, we're going Sorcerer three. Um, we get second level Sorcerer spells, and there are lots of good options here. You take whatever you find most useful, fun, or powerful. I'm not gonna get into it too much. There's some great options. Um, but then we also get meta magic, right? So um, we get the ability to twist our spells to suit our needs. And uh, we get two meta magic options here that let us do really powerful kind of extra things with our spells at the cost of our sorcery points, right? Uh, you can only use one per spell unless otherwise noted. And first off, we definitely want to get the Quicken Spell Meta Magic option. This lets us, for two sorcery points, um, take a spell that normally requires an action to cast and cast it as a bonus action instead. Now, keep in mind that if we cast a spell as a bonus action, no matter what kind of spell it is, whether it's a cantrip, spell slot, whatever, um, using Quicken Spell to do so, the only other spell we can cast on that turn is a cantrip that requires an action to cast. Fortunately for us, Eldritch Blast meets that requirement. So yes, you could quicken Eldritch Blast and then use your action to cast Eldritch Blast again, thereby getting it twice. Or, for example, um, quicken Spike Growth on your very first turn, and then as your action, use Eldritch Blast, and now you're kind of grating the cheese right from the beginning, right? Instead of having to wait until the next turn. For the second meta magic option, I would probably go with Seeking Spell. It's new to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, uh, and it lets us re-roll the d20 if we miss with a spell that requires an attack roll. Um, we can even use it if we've already used another meta, meta magic option on that spell, um, which is great. Sometimes it's just going to be really important for you to hit and move your target, so this will be really nice to have when you really need it. Um, subtle Spell could also be really nice. Uh, letting you cast a spell without somatic or verbal components, meaning meaning you might be able to, for example, like lay down some spike growth without your enemies noticing until it's too late and kind of you know get the jump on them there at the beginning. Um, I suppose you'd have to work the material components to spike growth uh, stealthily, because a uh, subtle spell just lets you forego the verbal and 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 somatic, right? But anyway, um, a nice potential option, I think. Okay, so. I promised that I would use kind of some roll 20 here to, um, you know, give us a little bit of a, an idea as to how this might work in game. So um, here's, here's us, okay? And these are our little allies over here. Here's the bad guys we're fighting, like some trolls and orcs or whatever. So beginning, you know, round one, this is you. You're going to quicken spike growth and cast it like this behind your enemy that you're going to be attacking. Um, and then you're going to Eldritch Blast them, boom, boom, they move 10 feet doing so, taking the Eldritch Blast damage and of course the damage from Spike Growth. Um, you're gonna hit them again with your second Eldritch Blast beam to knock them here. And then, you know, with one of those attacks, whichever one that hits, if you want to, you can move them, thanks to Crusher, uh, an extra five feet. That might just be the here. You know, you might wanna pull them forward, whatever you wanna do. Um, Keep in mind that on subsequent rounds, if you wanted to, um, you could, if you had the sorcery points to do so, and of course, you can convert your sorcerer spells to sorcery points, which I would probably do, at least at least convert one or two spell slots so that you can you know, do a couple of quicken spells, right? Um, but so for burst damage here, you could, you could potentially fire Eldritch Blast twice, right? So one beam, two beams, that's your quicken spell, then three beams, four beams, and one of them with the crusher, you maybe pull them forward, I think, five feet. And then on their turn, right, they're gonna have to decide if they're a ranged enemy, I guess they can make range attacks, so try and do this against melee enemies. If they wanna get to you, they either have to run through all of this, right, which would be silly, or they probably go boom, boom, they take an extra 2d4 of damage going through that final square, that was difficult terrain, so that cost them 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet, 25 feet, 30 feet. They have to dash 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and they'd still only be right here at the end of their turn. So that's now, of course, fantastic control, uh, as well as damage that you've been dealing to this uh, particular character, not to mention, you know, these other characters that maybe you caught in your little spike growth area. So, 
Let's do a damage report for level six. Um, I'm assuming that we're hitting an enemy just with two Eldritch Blasts. Um, you know, we don't have the sorcery points currently anyway to sort of call that sustainable, right? To quicken a spell every single turn. Um, so just two Eldritch Blasts, one with advantage, thanks to our bum tickler. Um, both of them with a plus three to damage from Agonizing Blast, because that's our Charisma modifier right now, pushing the enemy through 10 feet of, of thorns and thistles. Um, one of those attacks pushing an additional, or pulling an additional five feet of move speed uh, through the briar patch and uh, doing an extra three damage, uh, thanks to, to our um, genie patron. That's our proficiency bonus right now. For a total of 2d10 plus 10d4 plus eight damage. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, that is 43 damage per round on average, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, that's 34 damage per round on average. Um, pretty solid DPR. I would call it uh, kind of upper half of the, of the pack when compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done, uh, which is good. Um, it also provides some really nice control, of course, though potential drawback, right? It could potentially make things a little difficult for your allies, um, depending on how many of them are melee and whether or not they have to wade through your briar patch to get to the bad guys, right? We'll kind of talk about that a little bit more in the final thoughts, but something to keep in mind. All right, at level seven, um, we're a sorcerer four and we get an ability score increase or feat. Um, I'm gonna recommend taking telekinetic. Uh, telekinetic was again new to Tasha's, uh, and it's just it's a fantastic feat, especially for us. It's it's a half feat first of all, which means that we get to bump our charisma by one, and we had a 17 before, so now we're an 18, which is fantastic. And then as a bonus action, we can force an enemy to make a strength saving throw against our spell DC, uh, which is a 15 at the moment, not terrible, or be moved five feet away from or towards us. Um, so now we have a, a sort of a weaponized bonus action since that means we get to drag them through spike growth, right? If we, um, and, and so it's great to use if we don't have uh, or don't want to spend, um, you know, sorcery points to do a quicken spell as a bonus action. Now we can, you know, at least get this telekinesis uh, going to, to move them, cause them to take damage and increase our control and our ability to kind of position the enemy where we want them positioned. Um, the biggest downside, of course, to telekinetic is that the enemy gets to make a strength save, um, which is among the higher saving throws that most enemies that you'll face, uh, at least at most tables anyway, uh, in D&D, &D, uh, among the higher saving throws that enemies have. Still, it should work more often than not, um, but I would like to get our DC a little bit higher, and to that end, at level 8, we're going to go back to Warlock for a minute. So we're a Warlock 4, um, and we get another ability score increase or feat, I'm gonna say, you know, we bump our charisma. So we're capped now at a charisma 20 and, and that feels really nice, you know, getting that capped as soon as we possibly can. Um, especially since we don't have other ways inherently to, you know, increase our chance to hit um, or, you know, get advantage other than that on that first attack, thanks to our familiar. Um, and also, especially now that our enemy movement, at least some of our enemy movement, uh, thanks to telekinesis, is potentially dependent upon our spell DC. Uh, I really wanted to get that charisma up as quickly as possible and as high as possible. At level nine, we are a Warlock five, and this is a really important level for us. So important, in fact, that I seriously considered, you know, trying to rush to Warlock five first before taking any sorcerer levels. Um, you may want to do that, and if so, that's fine. To me, getting to quicken spell felt a little more important for this build, so that we could start the cheese grading like right you know, from round one on most fights. But anyway, at Warlock 5, we get a third invocation, and we want to take um, Grasp of Hadar. So once on each of our turns, when you hit a creature with Eldritch Blast, you can move them in a straight line up to 10 feet closer to you. Up until this point, keeping someone inside our briar patch was a little tougher since we could really only push. Um, you know, now the crusher feet let us move them back five feet and telekinetic five feet more too. So that's that's nice. And, and we don't have enough Eldritch Blasts at this point for it to really negatively affect us and keep us from being able to keep them inside the briar patch. Um, but with this, with Grasp of Hadar, we can now push and pull, which is fantastic, right? And really helps us you know, kind of 
keep them positioned right where we want them, as it were. Most enemies could still get out even of the middle of the briar patch with just a dash, right? But they're going to take a lot more damage for it if they're kind of closer to the middle when they do that. It's a bummer that Grasp of Hadar only works once per turn, as opposed to Repelling Blast, right, which, which can work on every Eldritch Blast if we want. But once per turn should be enough for us to keep them in the Briar Patch, at least until very late when we're just getting tons and tons of uh, Eldritch Blasts, which I'll talk about later. Anyway, we also, as a Warlock 5, get third level spells. There's lots of great ones, uh, none of which are going to really change our go-to combat tactics here, so I'm not going to really get into any of them. Pick your favorites. Obviously, you know, Counterspell and Dispel Magic are great options and pretty important. Um, Fly is super useful, uh, though we might not need that later. Um, Hypnotic Pattern, great for control, right? You, you guys know there's lots of great third level spells. Pick your favorites. Um, let's do a damage report now at level nine. So we're still just making two Eldritch Blast attacks, but now our plus to hit is three higher uh, than we were at last check, thanks to you know bumping that charisma and our proficiency bonus going up. Um, we also get more movement options, including uh, a bonus action that's going to let us do an extra 2d4 of damage by dragging uh, dragging the enemy an extra five feet on our turn. Uh, assuming they fail their saving throw, of course. So, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their strength save, uh, we're going to be doing 55 damage per round on average, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class and plus six to their strength save, which you'll hardly ever see at this level, uh, it would be a 44 damage per round on average. So we've gone up some, not a ton. Um, we've slipped a little more towards the middle of the pack versus other sustained damage per round builds that I've done. And again, of course, for those who don't know, check out in the video description like the links to the graphs that I'm using to like compare these sustained damage builds to one another, uh, and also put you know the numbers for this particular build there as well. So. As far as I'm concerned, uh, we've sort of completed the core of the build, right? For, first we had the nucleus, and now the core is complete. Um, we, we do great sustained damage per round. We've got some solid control. We, put out, we can put out some pretty impressive burst damage um, with the help of Quicken Spell to like double fire Eldritch Blast. So the question is, where do we go from here? Um, if we're happy with our current sustained DPR and we really wanted to push uh, the like the the burst damage potential we could take a couple levels in fighter right that would give us action surge and let us potentially fire off three eldritch blasts in a single round um, that would be nice if we really wanted to push into like higher levels of caster to pick up those more powerful uh, high level spells I would say we probably just focus on straight warlock from here um, though straight sorcerer wouldn't be a terrible option either um, what about, some of you are asking yourselves, the Swarm Keeper Ranger? I've seen a lot of people uh, recommend going Swarm Keeper in a build like this because at level three, Swarm Keepers get this cool feature that says when they hit with an attack, uh, once per turn, their swarm can essentially move an enemy up to 15 feet in any direction so long as it's horizontal and they fail a strength saving throw against your spell DC. The problem, in my opinion, with going Swarm Keeper here is this. 15 more feet of movement would for sure be really nice. That's 6d4 more damage per turn. Um, but here's the thing. The enemy is going to get to make a strength save against it, right? Which, like I've said, is probably already going to be pretty high on average. And it's against our ranger spell DC, which is based on our wisdom. And we have not been prioritizing wisdom in this build. I think at this level, the enemy is going to make that saving throw more often than not. And unless we're willing to sacrifice a lot to kind of bump our wisdom, I just don't think it's worth it, right? And, and even then, I mean, we're talking three levels, first of all, to get there, and a couple of ability score increases probably to get a semi-reliable 64 of damage per turn. And it just doesn't feel that great to me. Yeah, we'd get some other nice things from Ranger, right? Medium armor, proficiency, shield, that sounds nice. You'd get some utility, more spell slots, um, but I, I just don't think it's worth it. I think there is definitely a build out there uh, for a Swarm Keeper cheese grater, right? I just don't think it's this one. Um, you may disagree, and if so, and you really want to go Ranger here, knock yourself out. As for us, 
I think we're going to sort of split the rest of our time between Warlock and Sorcerer. There are some great reasons for picking up more levels in each, I think, and you guys know me, right? I, I love to kind of push the limit of anything as far as I can. So with this Briar Patch thing, I really want to kind of see how far we can take it. Um, and even if that means foregoing other things like higher level spells and stuff like that. Um, so that's what we're doing and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and we're gonna get some really cool tricks along the way. So let's see where we go. So at level 10, we're sticking with Warlock and we're gonna be a Warlock 6. This is one of those fun tricks that I just mentioned. So as a Genie Warlock, we get an Elemental Gift feature and our genie grants us two things. One is resistance to bludgeoning damage because we chose Dao as our genie kind. And you know what? That's actually pretty powerful. Bludgeoning damage is a fairly common uh, damage type that we see from monsters in games, so that's great. More importantly, I think we get the gift of flight. So proficiency bonus times per day as a bonus action, we get a flying speed of 30 feet and it lasts for 10 minutes. That's incredible. It's not just for fantastic utility purposes, but uh, but here's here's what I love about it. So what I would really love to be able to do right now is find sort of more ways to slow our enemies that are stuck in our briar patch. Um, almost any enemy could, could actually get out of the briar patch, uh, even if they were in the very middle of it, just by dashing, right? And of course, while forcing them to waste their turn dashing, causing them to take a bunch of damage, doing so is great. I would love to make things even stickier for our target. So now, if we can fly, we could potentially hit our enemy once, right, to sort of push them into the middle of the briar patch and then fly up above them and hit them with an Eldritch Blast using Grasp of Hadar and pull them towards us 10 feet into the air. Um, this means that they would fall and take 1d6 of damage by falling 10 feet. And while that is worse than the 4d4 that they would take by moving through 10 feet of thorns, if you take any damage from falling, you're knocked prone. Rules as written, right? And so now, on their turn, they have to use half of their movement speed to stand up. Many monsters would only then be able to move one square um, to you know for the rest of their movement, and then dashing would probably just barely get them out of the spike growth area, uh, assuming 30 feet of movement, um, and depending on where they are in the spike growth, right? But this gets even better at the next level, because when we're level 11 and we're a Warlock 7, we get a fourth invocation, and I would take Lance of Lethargy as our invocation. This tells us that once per turn, when we hit an enemy with Eldritch Blast, we can reduce their move speed by 10 feet until the end of our next turn. So let's take a look at roll 20 again really quick to kind of talk about what this might look like when you kind of do this all together. So let's say um, you're in combat, you've got spike growth down on the ground, and this is kind of what the battlefield looks like, right? As your bonus action, you give yourself the gift of flight. Ideally, you do this before combat even starts so that you don't have to spend a bonus action here, but anyway. So you're flying. Now, First thing you do is you hit your enemy with your first Eldritch Blast, moving them back 10 feet, maybe applying the, you know, the Crusher feet to give you another 5, and then you can fly 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, let's say you go 30 to here. And you are, you're in the air though, you're 10 feet above uh, the enemy at least, 10 or 15 feet. And keep in mind, moving diagonal is still just considered 5 feet of movement, so this should work fine. Um, you hit them with Eldritch Blast, this time using Lance of Lethargy and you pull them towards you, right? So they, f they fly up into the air and maybe they land here. I moved my character out of the way so as to not cause confusion, but you're basically right on top of each other, right? So now the monster's here. You apply your um, Lance of Lethargy. Sorry, I think I said Lance of Lethargy before. I meant Grasp of Hadar. You guys know what I'm talking about. But they have Lance of Lethargy applied to them as well. And so their move speed, assuming they're a 30, f you know, 30 feet of move speed enemy, their move speed is now 20 feet. So on their turn, they stand up from being prone, right? So now they have 10 feet of move speed left. And where do they go? They probably go this way. This costs them 10 feet of move speed. So now they're out of move speed. And maybe they dash, right? And so they go, you know, 10 feet of move speed, 10 feet of move speed. Since they only have 20 feet of move speed, this is as far as they can get. Um, they can't get out of the briar patch. And so on our turn, we were right here. We could, you know, fly back around here and start 
blasting them again, you know, doing the same thing. Or fly over here, kind of lift them up in the air so they land and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it just becomes a lot easier to kind of keep the enemy contained in the briar patch uh, until they're dead. Now, obviously this isn't gonna work on every enemy, right? But when it does, it will be glorious. Eldritch Blast, by the way, at level 11, fires three times now, and that does absolute wonders for our damage and uh, our control. Um, and we also get fourth level spells as a Warlock level seven. And again, I would say, you know, pick your favorites. Um, it's not gonna change our tactics too much. Uh, Dimension Door is of course fantastic. In a pinch, you could quicken Dimension Door, teleport to the other side of the Briar Patch, right as an enemy was like about to make their escape. And then as your action, sort of blast them back into the middle, right? Other than that, again, I'd say pick your favorites. Um, keep in mind, one thing, if you are going to do this pull them into the air to knock them prone trick, uh, wait to do so until your last attack for that turn, right? Because once you succeed and they go prone, you're going to have disadvantage to hit them if you're making ranged attacks against them. Also, there is no reason, keep in mind, uh, why you need to be using all of your Eldritch Blast lasers on a single enemy, right? In fact, if it were me, especially now that I can fly, I, I can very much imagine like, Primarily my tactic being to sort of skirt around the edge of the briar patch sort of blasting You know as many enemies as I can back into the middle um, So as to keep them away from my friends to keep them snared keep them taking damage when they try and move into attacking position Etc, etc. Of course something to talk over with your allies your allies may want an enemy or two or three Outside of the briar patch so they don't have to wade in there to go get them right but anyway potential great option for both damage and control at level 12 um the thing that I want to focus on now more than anything is getting more attacks more consistently. And so to that end, I think the best way to accomplish that is for us to get more sorcery points. So we're going back to sorcerer for a minute. Um, so as a sorcerer level five, we get third level sorcery spells. Um, again, I would say your choice. There's a lot of great options, none of which I'll really focus on. I would probably grab fireball. Uh, for some decent area of effect damage, uh, but otherwise, knock yourself out. At level 13, we are a Sorcerer 6, and um, you get the Bend Luck feature from uh, Wild Magic Sorcery, which is actually like the main reason why I wanted to go Wild Magic. Uh, when a, another creature you can see makes an attack, an ability check, or a save, as a reaction, you can spend two Sorcery points and roll a 1d4 to add or subtract from the roll. Um, and you can even wait until after they roll to decide if you want to do that. So it can be a really nice way to help an enemy fail their save, their strength save against your telekinesis, for example, um, or you know to help an ally succeed in an attack, or an enemy fail at a at a saving throw. You know when your friend's casting a spell, help the enemy fail at a saving throw. Just a really nice little sort of on-demand bless or bane, um, which I love. Okay, so level 13 damage report. Here's the thing. At this point, we have six sorcery points from our sorcery levels, sorcerer levels, and we can potentially convert our sorcerer spell slots into up to 19 more sorcery points for a total of 25. That's a, that's a total of 12 uses of quickened spell per long rest, right? Now, you may think it would be foolish to blow all of our sorcery spell slots on uh, sorcery points. You'd probably be right. I've never claimed to not be a fool. With so many at our disposal, I think it's fair to say that we could call, you know, using quick and spell every turn somewhat sustainable. Um, it would vary at each table, of course. Um, how many combat encounters do you have per long rest? How long do those encounters typically last? But for example, if each combat encounter lasted like four or five rounds on average, which I think is fairly typical, and you have even three encounters per long rest, which I also think is fairly typical, that's a, that's a quick and spell on pretty much every turn, or almost every turn. At the very least, I'm confident that we could use quick and spell every turn for at least one entire combat encounter per day, probably two, um, and maybe even more, at le and, and, and still have some spell slots for casting shield or misty step or counter spell, etc. when we need it. Um, and, and of course, <laughs> the spike growth spell itself. Because we do have those Warlock spell slots, don't forget. So I'm going to assume now that we're getting two rounds of Eldritch Blast uh, every turn when I crunch the numbers. Obviously, 
you can shrink those numbers down if you'd rather not be so foolhardy. Uh, and instead, just using your bonus action to like telekinetically move a target five feet for a little more damage and positioning. Don't forget, it does cost us a bonus action to convert a spell slot into sorcery points. So you'd probably need to be doing that like between combats, right? And just you'd have to guess a little bit at how many spell slots you're gonna need, you're gonna want to save, how many sorcery points you're gonna need. Um, but assuming we do that, though, you know, on every turn we'd now be making six Eldritch Blast attacks per round, uh, one with advantage, all doing plus five from Charisma, plus forty-four for Thorns damage, plus two d four. Um, and plus five on one of those attacks, right, due to the genie, wrath, and crusher combo. Um, no, for number crunching purposes, I'm not doing the fly above them, lift them up into the air maneuver here, just because I'm trying to maximize our damage. But I think it's a neat trick, and I think you should totally use it, on, especially on monsters with 30 feet or less of move speed. For the record, then, this is a total of 6d10 plus 26d4 plus 35 damage against an enemy with an armor class of 10. Uh, we would be doing on average 129 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would still be 100, 100 damage per round. Well, crap. <laughs> we're, we're blowing every other build out of the water at this point. And honestly, even for the characters that are sort of close, uh, the Bladesinger, the Death Cleric, um, by the way, the Death Cleric was doing, you know, their damage to two, two targets, right? They were using their highest level spell slot for a concentration, and so definitely those numbers that I report on that are putting out, if you look in the graph, are only usable like one combat encounter per long rest. And, and in the Bladesinger's case, I was assuming that the target wasn't resistant to non-magical damage that you're doing from animate objects. And in hindsight, I kind of wish I hadn't assumed that at level 13 because it's seems fairly unlikely, depending on your table and the monsters that you typically fight, right? These numbers are making me nervous um, because they're really high. So let's keep going and see how far we can. At level 14, um, if you feel like you really need more spell slots for sorcery points to kind of maintain that, you know, high sustained DPR, or if there are like fourth, fifth, sixth level sorcerer spells that you really want, feel free to just stick with sorcerer here. Um, I think I prefer going warlock, uh, going back to warlock for a few reasons that we will get into as we go. Um, so first of all, at warlock eight, which is what we would be here, you get an ability score increase or feat. Um, there's actually quite a few good ones to choose from, I think. Um, for me, it's between three. Crossbow expert, uh, would be really nice because it lets us make ranged attacks from uh, five feet away without disadvantage, right? Typically we have disadvantage. And for those times that an enemy is up in your business, being able to like push them away with your Eldritch Blast and not have disadvantage on that attack would be a really nice to have. I think Resilient Wisdom uh, it would be a great choice here because it lets us bump our wisdom, but then also add our proficiency bonus to our wisdom saves and particularly as we start to get higher level, I think a, a good wisdom save is important to keep us from getting controlled mostly by uh, enemy spellcasters and things like that. Um, I think Fey Touched might be my favorite choice. One, it also lets us bump our wisdom. So, you know, if you're going to do this and you're planning ahead, I'd probably take an odd wisdom score when you're, when you're creating your character. I didn't even talk about it. But it lets us bu bump our wisdom by one and then gives us the ability to cast Misty Step and one other spell of our choice from the Divination or Enchantment School uh, once per day without spending a spell slot. Um, I think that movement becomes increasingly important for this character uh, as we get higher level, especially to try and bounce around from one side of the other, you know, of the briar patch to try and keep the enemies contained and positioned. Um, and since we're planning on using so many of our spell slots for sorcery points, being able to have, you know, a misty step once per day without spending a spell slot is super nice. At level 15, we are a Warlock 9, and we get a fifth invocation. I would recommend taking Eldritch Mind. Um, the truth is, I wish I could have gotten this invocation a long time ago, as it gives us advantage on um, our checks to maintain concentration. And, this, and concentration is so important for our damage, obviously, for spike growth, right? Um, now that we have both proficiency in our uh, constitution saving throws and this invocation, um, we should very, very rarely be dropping uh, spike growth. We also get fifth level spells. 
Of course, there's lots of great options. Synaptic Static is probably my favorite as it provides like fireball level damage almost with a fireball sized radius of 20 feet, but requires an intelligence save instead of dexterity, meaning it's much less likely to be resisted by most enemies that you'll typically face. And best of all, if the enemy fails their save, um, they have to subtract a d6 from all of their attacks, ability checks, and concentration checks for one minute. They get to make a save at the end of their turn to try and, you know, lose that uh, that debuff. But anyway, your whole team will love you when you use this, right? The best part of being a ninth level warlock, of course, is the fact that you have two fifth level spell slots that reset on a short rest. That, in and of itself, is absolutely amazing. And I hope that you're using your sorcerer spell slots, your second level sorcerer spell slots, to be casting spike growth. Um, unless you really, really need the sorcery points because um, it doesn't upcast for any benefit, spike growth. And you could use those lock uh, spell slots for cooler stuff. But of course, that's something that you'll have to manage and figure out as you go. Um, one other spell that I will mention here is uh, Bestow Curse. So it's a fantastic spell. It's a third level spell um, that I didn't talk about. But uh, you touch a creature, they make a wisdom save, and if they fail it, you can curse them in one of the following ways. They either will have disadvantage on saves and checks uh, with a, an ability score of your choice, um, disadvantage on attacks against you, a wisdom save at the start of their turn, and if they fail it, they spend their turn doing nothing, or um, they'll take an extra 1d8 of damage from you on each attack. Um, the problem with it is that it requires concentration. That's why I didn't talk about it before. And our concentration is spoken for, of course. However, if you cast it using a fifth level spell slot or higher, it does not require concentration, which is why I'm talking about it now, which just makes the spell mind-bogglingly amazing. If uh, you have the spell slot to cast it now, um, I would love to assume that we've cast this on our enemy when I crunch the numbers for the next damage report. I don't think I will, though. Uh, it's It's... The problem is it's an action to cast. Even if it doesn't require concentration, it's an action to cast. So that means even if we quickened it, say, in round one or two or whatever, then the only other spell we could cast is a cantrip. So we'd, you know, we'd quicken, maybe we quicken Spike Growth, Eldritch Blast, and then quicken Bestow Curse, and then Eldritch Blast. I mean, by the time that we kind of really get to see the benefit from this, and by round three where we're back to like double uh, Eldritch Blast every round, the target's probably dead, right? So, and, and it just, it took too long to, to kind of get going. If you can somehow get this off before combat starts, or maybe get spike growth off before combat starts, and then start with like a quickened curse, bestow curse, and then Eldritch Blast, and kind of go from there, I would say go for it. Um, if you're up against a, like a big bad that's going to take, you know is going to take several rounds to bring down, you know, I'd maybe recommend considering using this. Otherwise, you're probably not going to be using Bestow Curse that much. At level 16, you are a Warlock 10, and as a Genie Warlock 10, you get the Sanctuary Vessel feature. So now, when you enter your vessel, uh, which you can only do once per day, by the way. Did I mention that earlier? I'm not sure if I did. But anyway, when you enter your vessel, um, you can choose to bring up to five willing creatures with you. You guys want to play at my house? <laughs> this is so great, right? So you can bring your whole party, probably, depending on your party size, I suppose. And if you stay there for just 10 minutes, you can benefit from a short rest, which is amazing. It's like the cat nap spell, right? And anyone who spends hit dice to regain health while they're in there, taking their little short rest, can add your proficiency bonus to the hit points that they gain. Even more amazing. Look at you, little team player. Uh, you know, maybe the barbarian won't be quite as mad at you now for all of the thorns that they're constantly having to pick out of their heels. <laughs> Finally, at level 17, we are a Warlock 11. Um, we get our third Warlock spell slot now, which is huge. So now we have three fifth level spell slots that refresh on a short rest. All the other casters are jealous, very jealous of you. Um, you get your first Mystic Arcanum, a sixth level Mystic Arcanum. Um, just in case you didn't know, sixth level spells and beyond for Warlocks don't use your spell slots. Instead, um, you get to choose one sixth level spell and cast it once per day. Uh, there are so many great sixth level spells to choose from. 
mass suggestion is potentially game breaking in some scenarios and depending on your dm um, i love soul cage arcane gate is nice to have when you really need it but the one i would probably take for this build is scatter um, so with scatter we're told up to five creatures within 30 feet of you and remember you can fly now so you can position yourself pretty effectively for this have to make a wisdom save or be teleported to an unoccupied space that you can see within 20 feet 120 feet of you sorry can you imagine the dismay on your enemy's faces when they finally wade through all the briars and brambles and get out of the briar patch and then on your turn you quicken spell scatter pull them all back right into the middle and then just keep blasting away at them they will be so defeated they will be so sad one thing to note also a creature can willingly fail their save for this spell meaning that you know you can use it on your friends to like get across a ravine when a bridge is out or something like that it can be really handy to have in a pinch um most importantly of course at level 17 eldritch blast now fires four times when we cast it um, meaning that uh, we get, you know, two more blasts if we're quick and spell, you know, using it to get two rounds off. Um, that's eight total beams, not to mention 20 more feet of movement on the, on the enemy, right? One other thing to mention here, I rarely take my builds past level 17 because so few of us actually play the game at this level and beyond, but one of the other main reasons why I wanted to finish in Warlock was because if we go all the way to level 20 and we keep taking Warlock levels from here, then we get the ultimate ability from Genies, uh, which is Limited Wish, which is really, really strong. Basically lets you cast um, any 6th level spell or lower from any class. Uh, you, and you don't need to meet the requirements or even have the expensive spell components um, that would otherwise be required. So now once you use this feature you can't do so again until 1d4 long rests have passed um but it's incredibly powerful obviously and it would be a shame to be a genie warlock and never get this feature so anyway final damage report at level 17 we now have eight eldritch blasts and 85 feet of movement per turn um now only 15 feet of that can be in a direction other than a push away right uh, the other the other 70 feet has to be us pushing them away and so keep in mind that there's only to there's only 40 total feet of of thorns in a given direction so i think that the most we'd actually be able to sort of drag them over back and forth is like 70 feet worth of uh spike growth damage here even though we're we can potentially move them up to 85. um Feel free to play around with that in Roll20 and let me know if you think I'm wrong, but that's the best I could do after playing with it for just a couple of minutes. So anyway, final damage report. Against an enemy with 10 armor class, we would be doing 159 damage per round on average, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it would be 130 damage per round on average. And that's not burst damage. Um, that's sustained or at least sustainable for like an entire combat encounter or two per day, if not more. So how does this sustained damage compare to other DPR builds that I've done? Let's find out in the final thoughts. Um, I kind of have a lot to say here, so bear with me. As for where this build ranks in uh, relation to my other, you know, in, my other sustained damage per round, um, builds that I explained in a little short video that I did quite a while ago. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a new champion. Um, this one beats out Bladesinger by about half a point with their, um, with their ranking score coming in at a 77. Uh, rounded down, it's like 77.3 or something like that. The reality is, um, not only that, but the numbers that I've been giving you are probably suppressed a little because most enemies would likely be moving on their turn to try and get out of the briar patch, right? So your damage per round would very often be at least a little bit higher. Now, of course, that ranking system that I use is not really all that useful. It's just some very oversimplified math. Um, that I primarily created just as a way to kind of separate my builds from one another so I could fit them all in a single graph, right? What's more, this build, of course, as we've talked about, is dependent upon the use of sorcery points uh, every single turn, and you might run out of them. Uh, but if you're going to call foul for that, 
then you have to be even harsher on some of my other builds, right? That rely on the highest spell slot you have available for your concentration, like Blade Singer and Death Cleric, or my my first Sorlock build, uh, right? The Eldritch. Uh, what did I call that one? <laughs> the, the Eldritch Sorcerer. If we define sustainable as sustainable for at least an entire combat encounter and maybe more, like I said at the beginning, then this definitely qualifies. Now. Of course, there are other potential weaknesses to this build. Uh, most notably, it depends a lot on enemy position. They might not always be in the position that you want them to every single round, right? Uh, where are they when they start the fight? Where are they in round two, um, etc. And of course, there are always ways to counter it. Um, but that actually gets me to, I think, the most important point that I want to make here. Honestly, I feel like the biggest drawback to this build might be that it has the potential to be like a little too game breaking. I could I could even see like the softest, most kind-hearted, lenient DM out there kind of throw their hands up after a few levels of this and just be like, okay, fine, from now on, all of my enemies can fly and or, you know, I'm gonna have multiple spellcasters in every single encounter that will all have the counterspell spell so that every time you try and cast spike growth, they're just gonna counterspell it, etc. And when that happens, you'll go from being like overpowered to like fairly trivial really quick. Now, of course, Every character in D&D, as far as I'm concerned, can potentially be countered if you have a DM determined to do so, to, to, that's determined to like counter you and play a tactics game against you, right? Um, I think most DMs, the good ones anyway, in my personal opinion, um, wouldn't actively seek to counter your character unless between the two of you, you've talked and you agreed that like that's the type of game you want to play. But the more powerful your character is, the more tempting countering you starts to become for your DM, I think. So as always, but maybe especially with this build, um, make sure you talk with your DM uh, about the character that you want to create, how it's going to work in game, and whether or not they are on board with the potential disruption and damage that you're about to cause like for their combat encounters. Um, no, that does not mean that like they have to agree to you know fill every single one of your combat encounters with nothing but creatures who only have 30 feet of movement speed, can't fly, can't cast counterspell, etc., etc. Um, but work through it. Talk talk with them about it, right? So that you can both sort of manage expectations as to how well this is going to work in game, how frequently it will work in game, and that that will be to like mutual satisfaction, right? Um, and of course, talking with your fellow players here is also especially important, I think. If you have a party full of mostly melee characters, they might get really annoyed with you if they have to go wading through, you know, your briar patch every single time they want to get into range of, of you know, attacking an enemy. Um, of course, most combat encounters will have multiple enemies, so you could always focus on just kind of cheese grating one, letting the other ones get out so that, you know, your allies can also uh, mix it up in melee. Um, but just work that out like in a session zero or whatever before you play. That would be my advice. That is the build for the week. I love you guys so much. I had a lot of fun creating this character. I would love to play it in game, same with all of my characters, but I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Please do subscribe and like and comment. Um, uh, so that we can uh, bring you more and better content, especially uh, consider joining the channel if you would. I would really appreciate it. Um, it's not very expensive, but it does give you one little perk of getting like a little written cheat sheet uh, for my build each and every week. That's it. hope you have a fantastic day. I hope to see you again very soon. And until then, take care. Thanks, guys.